Hello and welcome to this ultimate Amityville video. So here's the deal. I'm going to keep this really short because this is an introduction to the introduction that I have done a year and a half after I've originally uploaded this video. I originally put this video out September 4th, 2020. And at that time, my channel had less than 1000 subscribers. And the date that I'm recording this is February 17th, 2022. Hence the hair change. So the reason that I'm doing a re-edit and a re-upload of this video is when I put this video out originally, I was not including video clips in my reviews, only still pictures from the source material. And I didn't quite yet have the experience to know what I was doing enough to not only stay within legal compliance of fair use, which I had, but also to avoid triggering the automated systems that would flag the video. So what happened is, although this became the biggest video ever on the channel and firmly put me up in the place where I was able Able to get monetized and i'm very grateful for that it still got caught in youtube's net and had a dozen or so copyright claims put up against it that i've never been able to clear now on its own that would be fine except that i was winding up with more and more claims as time went on and it was getting more and more region locked at the last statistic that i saw my video was not available to 53 percent of anybody that tried to watch it to me, that was unacceptable, and I really had no other recourse than to do this re-edit and re-up. Now, the core of the content, my reviews, my opinions, and so forth, will be completely 100% on touched. I will not be making any revisions or modifications that change the messaging of my opinions of these films. However, I am changing some of the clips and some of the durations of the source material that is shown so that I wind up not just in legal compliance, but also in full compliance against automated checks that are going to wind up tripping things down the line. And lastly, before we begin, I just want to point out that at the time that I recorded this originally, I included every single Amityville movie that was available to me at that time but it turns out the list was somewhat incomplete and after some more acquisitions i did complete the list later on and there have been more coming out since then at the time that i'm recording this there have now been 38 amityville movies and i have reviewed each and every one of them so if you do wind up liking this video and you want to watch my opinion on the remaining ones that have continued coming out just go ahead and click on the Amityville playlist on the channel. I'm including each and every review on there. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get right into it. The Ultimate 22 Movie Amityville Review. Oh, well, hi there. Welcome to Rotted Reviews. So... I've been at this channel for a few years now, and one of the first projects that I underwent was reviewing the entirety of the biggest franchise I could find. And at that time, it was Puppet Master. That was 13 movies to that. And some time has passed. I need to reevaluate how many, uh, you know, Friday the 13th movies there are at this point, so on and so forth. But at that time, Puppet Master was the winner with 13 movies. And even though I enjoyed the journey immensely, it really was challenging. It was painful in parts and it kind of set the tone for a lot of what my channel would wind up becoming down the road. But while I was doing that research, before I started on everything and I wanted to find out what was the biggest franchise so that I could just tackle it and get it out of the way, technically Puppet Master was not the biggest. It was the biggest in terms of a licensable, protected franchise. But there was one that was an outlier that had way more than 13 movies to its name. And that's because it's a pretty common name. It's the name of a city. It, it, according to this franchise, if you can call it that, there's really nothing more than the name, the history behind true events, and some iconic windows. On the evening of November 13th, 1974, Ronald DeFeo murdered his entire family at the house on 112 Ocean Avenue in Amityville, New York. It became a very interesting case, a fairly large case, and raised a lot of questions. His family was killed, all of them by shotgun, all of them lying face down, seemingly killed while they were asleep. None of them seem to have any drugs in their system, according to toxicology. So how did he achieve 
room by room mass murder of his family without waking them up. It raises a lot of questions. And to this day, there's really no good answers. This is factual. This actually happened. Later on, the Lutz family bought and moved into the house and abruptly left after a short order, leaving all their possessions behind and foreclosing on the property, claiming that they had experienced supernatural events, which is under this a lot of scrutiny that those events were then investigated by Ed and Lorraine Warren, who you might know from the Conjuring series, and raised what was ultimately going to be the several books and movies of the Amityville horror. Now, because Amityville is the name of a town and it really doesn't exist beyond this house and those iconic windows, it really can't be protected franchise uh, like characters like Freddy and Jason and so on and so forth, where they were developed from, the, from creative minds and brought to the screen with iconic imagery and uh, copyrighted names and so on. So what this ultimately shakes out to is I could fart on camera for an hour and a half and legally release it as Amityville Gas Chamber. And nobody would have any rights to sue me. If I wanted to actually make something about the Lutz family or make something about the DeFeo family, okay, then we wind up in situations where rights and so on and so forth. But <laughs> if you just want to make a movie on the cheap and attach a famous name to it, Amityville is a good one to do, which means there is a glut of these movies out there with a broad range of quality and an even broader range of actual relevance to the Amityville history. And so now, over two years after first starting my channel, having done the Phantasm franchise, the Puppet Master franchise, Whispering Corridors, Halloween, so on, I'm finally going to tackle the franchise that has daunted me ever since I first started, ever since I first started looking up how many were in each and seeing that number associated with this one, never thinking I'd actually ever get around to it. I'm gonna do it right here and now. I'm pulling the Band-Aid off. It's gonna be one video, one long video. Come with me as I watch all 22 movies in the Amityville franchise. Let's go. All right, so systematically and chronologically taking apart these movies, we first start out with the original 1979, The Amityville Horror, starring James Brolin and Margot Kidder. So in this movie, we have the Lutz family as they move into their brand new house. It's an opportunity and a half. It is $80,000, which is a steal considering the location, the market, and the size of the house. It still stretches them beyond their financial abilities, but you know, with some penny pinching and some overtime, they can make it work. It just adds to the stress put on George Lutz, played by James Brolin. And they know the history of the house. They know about the DeFeo family. They know about the murders. There's really no mystery as far as why the house is as cheap as it is, but they get past it. Dude, a guy kills his whole family? Doesn't that bother you? Well, yeah, sure, but... Houses don't have memories. Uh, of course not. Nope, 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 nope. And of course, things start going wrong. General possession and haunting things, things crashing, unexplicable things, and uh, wind up with one person blaming another for other things, and the family getting fractured, and so on and so forth. And of course, the iconic scene with Rod Steiger getting in, attacked by black flies as he's trying to bless the house. I want to talk a little bit about this scene in particular because I loved it so much. It was one of my favorites of the entire film. It was fantastic, but I also don't understand why Rod Steger kept going with this movie. I enjoyed it overall, but uh, his presence as a character was basically to determine how evil this house was. In a moment in which things are still kind of ramping up in terms of we don't really know how serious this is for the family, a priest comes in, somebody that is legitimately threatening, and then it has to strike. So we get that sense. We get that sense of what it is, how powerful it is. And when he goes back to the parish and he tries to make the phone call and the phone burns his hand, we get a really fantastic sense of how much reach it has, which is very important. Reach in a haunted house is important to establish. Does it end at the property line? Does it end at the driveway? How far can this thing follow you? 
And that's one thing that the Father Delaney character establishes extraordinarily well. But once the phone burned his hand, I really think that Rod Steiger should have been out of it. Maybe have the scene where he's discussing the issues of the house with the uh, elders of the parish and so forth to kind of explain the church's non-involvement in the situation, their self-preservation. Uh, but beyond that, when he's doing the sermon and he goes blind and he's basically sitting on a park bench defeated, I don't really understand why they continued down with this storyline path. Rod Steiger, I love him to pieces, but he really didn't have any more interaction with the family. He really didn't have a whole lot more to contribute except for some creepy scenes. But the creepy scenes at that point were already happening with the family, and that's where our investment was. So, yeah, overall, I enjoyed this movie a lot. There was a great, some great things about it. First of all, the editing. I loved how when they're introducing the house, it was just quick cuts, very loud, very abrupt. They walk into a room to show off how clean it is and so forth. And then it immediately cuts to the scene of the DeFeo family getting killed in that room. Uh, now, this is an extra room. Uh... It does that room by room. It's very jarring, it's very sudden, and it's very effective. And I don't think we can really discuss the Amityville Horror without discussing those windows. Those windows are iconic for a reason. They're fantastic. And this movie did a wonderful job of expanding on that with beautiful lighting. The lighting of how narrow the uh, pupils, let's just call them, of the eyes went as things progressed on until finally they reached a head. It was sinister. It was malevolent. And it was, it sold the movie. This is really I think it's an interesting thought experiment. Would the Amityville Horror have taken off as a film and as a franchise if those windows didn't exist? Something to think about. I don't know. But I enjoyed what they did with them in this movie. So I'm going to go and throw off the scores here. As always, four different categories, each one worth up to 25 points for a total possible score of 100 points. And I promise that will be the one and only time I say that in this video. I'm not going to say it 22 times. And as you can see, I thought this was decent. Uh, it's a classic. It's iconic. It's all those things for a reason. I actually think that it's pretty high quality, but it's certainly not my favorite haunted house movie out there. Of course, it's not really haunted. It's demonic. Yeah, six of one half dozen of the other. It's not my favorite. I would be lying if I said that anything about the Amityville stood out to me as my favorite blank of any blank. It just... It was okay. It was okay. I enjoyed it. I really don't have a whole lot of complaints. I think there were parts of it that were done reasonably well, parts of it that were a little bit of a snoozer. Overall, I think it's worth watching. It is a classic. All right, not a bad start. No real painful movies yet. Of course, I'm only two into it. And now we need to talk about the 1982 movie Amityville 2, The Possession. So this was a little bit of a prequel and also not. Uh, this movie had a lot of similarities to the story of the DeFeo family, which lived there and, you know, the murders and so forth before the Lutz family moved in. But the names of the characters were changed. The family name was no longer DeFeo, it's Montelli. And there were several striking differences in the fine details, especially of the murders themselves. There were a lot of similarities in terms of character traits to one another. For instance, Papa DeFeo there was, a, from what I understand, a large abusive ass. And that came through with the performance put on by Burt Young. Overall, I really don't have a whole lot to say on this movie because a lot of it was just kind of more of the same. Yes, it was the original story-ish, but in the end, ultimately what it is is a family moves into the house, the house starts affecting them, they start possessing them, and one of them gets violent. So we really don't have a whole lot of differences between that and the original Amityville horror of the Lutz family, except for some quality differences, to be sure. The other big difference is that everything about the DeFeo family or the Montelli family in this situation gets wrapped up about two thirds of the way through the runtime in this one. And honestly, that was a big problem for me. The rest of the movie takes place with the eldest son, the murderer, uh, basically being attempted to be cleansed of the demonic possession that he was in by the priest that's been following the story. Uh, it, it really just kind of takes a sharp turn. I mean, for the first part, it wasn't anything terribly original, but it was enjoyable enough. Uh, there were some elements of it that I liked there. Um, as much as I think that it's weird, uh, it, honestly, there was an incestual overtone, well, a blatant storyline even in this one that worked for me only in so far as 
it was a purposeful slight against God. And that was one of the interesting things about taking a demonically possessed house as opposed to a haunted house. One of the big critical key differences is we're not dealing with a spirit that's simply at unrest or needs its mystery solved so it can you know move on it is something that is actively evil and trying to insult god himself and this movie did a good job of incorporating plot lines and storylines to make that uh, hammer home a lot harder but once we got to the two-thirds mark and everything had been kind of let's just say resolved in its own way <laughs> The rest of it was just kind of filler. I really, I, at that point, I checked out. I didn't have any more involvement. The stakes had changed. The stakes, we already knew what was going to happen to this family, but even so, it had me on the edge of my seat just a little bit and just kind of figuring out when and how and under what circumstances these events would unfold. And the stakes at that point were the lives of this family. And now the stakes shift. Now the stakes are not the life of this young man, it's the soul of this young man. And honestly, at that point, with everything that had been going on prior, I could give two figs about that. So the stakes weren't really relevant for me anymore. And I did kind of check out. I honestly wish that the last third of the movie didn't take place and it just stretched the first two thirds out more. Next movie up is the 1983 film Amityville 3D. In this movie, we have Tony Roberts playing John Baxter, who is a writer for a skeptic magazine. And the movie starts out with him holding a bit of a honeypot in terms of a seance that he was exposing for the frauds that they were. Magazine. Congratulations, you just made our next cover, Mr. Caswell. You, you have no right, you can't do that! Once that was tied up nice and tidy, he was talking with the realtor that lent the property to the scam artist and finding out that the house was actually the most interesting thing about their operation. Once he finds out how much of a steal it actually is to buy because of its history, he decides to go ahead and buy it. He's in the middle of a divorce, he doesn't really have a whole lot of uh, places to live, he has a tiny little apartment and so on and the price is too good to pass up for the opportunities that this could afford him. And of course, things start going wrong, but being who he is, he's not simply going to roll over and just accept everything as it is. He's going to try and find out why. What's going on with a skeptical mind and a scientific approach? That is one of the reasons that I have a confession to make. I think this was my favorite so far of the three. I just finished watching it, and I enjoyed almost every minute of it. I loved the hook of this. I love the idea that we're not going to just take this as face value. We're not going to put in a family, you know, just go through the, you know, right again, a family buys the house and so on and so forth. No, this is a skeptic through and through. That's his job. It's in his blood to see these kind of things and question why, how, what's going on, who's pulling the strings who's holding the fishing line. And as we get towards the end of things, the scientific approach to try and investigate what's going on with thermal cameras and all sorts of monitoring equipment and so on, it's a take on things that I had not seen in this house before and I loved every minute of it. And yes, he brings a scientific analysis to things, but does that mean he's ever actually really in control of the situation? Does that mean that he's ever really actually safe and really battling this thing? Of course not. He's always out of his element whether he knows it or not. And that is something that really, it takes an interesting character and an interesting hook and it pits, ag pits it against this interesting evil in a way we hadn't seen before. And Tony Roberts playing John Baxter did an amazing job at selling this. Side note, this also has Meg Ryan and Lori Laughlin in it. Uh, so honestly, as much as I think that the original is iconic, just on a purely enjoyment level, this one's tops for me. I'm very, I'm as surprised as anyone else. The fourth movie in the list is the 1989 movie, Amityville, The Evil Escapes. The demonic presence in the Amityville house is facing a mass exorcism and escapes through a floor lamp, which is then sold in a garage sale and shipped off to California. Fuck, now we're having fun now, aren't we? So, okay, four movies in, and I feel like we've really come off the rails already nice and good and proper. So yes, a floor lamp gets invaded, even with a little bulb coming from the house 
all the way through the cord, Tom and Jerry style, into the floor lamp, and then it is sent off to California as a gift for this lady's sister. At the same time, this lady has her daughter and grandchildren moving into the house. They've been uh, befallen by tragedy. They needed somewhere to live. Takes them into her house, which has plenty of room and no end of judgment. But Amanda, I mean, that makeup and those, those clothes and Brian's hair. Now, what sort of haircut is that? So, of course, when things start going wrong, I think it's not entirely unreasonable, although a little bit bitchy, that the children get blamed instead of the floor lamp, but soon the evil does ultimately reveal itself, and then the pre one of the priests of the original exorcism tracks it down, finds it, and engages in the battle with this family. All right, so this was a made-for-TV movie, and it really feels like it through and through. There were some parts of it that I liked. The aesthetics were actually not too bad. It was very, very late 80s, but it worked all, you know, all right enough. The young priest helping them, I thought, did a very admirable job. I've seen him in a few other bit roles here and there, but uh, ultimately, I actually enjoy him as an actor. Uh, I don't really have a whole lot of complaints beyond the concept itself. As far as the execution goes... I think they did a lot with what they wound up having, or at least starting with. Um, really, I think my major complaint was the nature of the lamp itself. Taking the ridiculousness of the situation off the table and just discussing the device of using this lamp as the conduit of evil, we kept on having a situation of having the lamp turn on. Having a lamp turn on when it's not plugged in is... I guess a little bit creepy, a little bit spooky, but man, this movie really milked that. Uh, every time something bad was about to happen, uh, the lamp would turn itself on. And that made for, first of all, a movie in which you're just watching a lamp turn itself on and off a million times. Not the most terribly interesting thing, but also it's just kind of cue the scary shit. One of the best things about scares is how they take you by surprise. If you're literally lighting up a cue marker, the surprise is gone. So the whole nature of the scariness of this movie is just completely off the table. It was interesting. The characters were somewhat adequate. Everything about it was okay-ish, but the one thing that it really wasn't was scary in the slightest. All right, five out of 22. 1990s, The Amityville Curse. And I'm honestly not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about this one because there's honestly just not a whole lot to talk about. This uh, basically had to do with a group of people that accidentally stumbled across a house in the town of Amityville and decided to go ahead and flip it, uh, basically, before flipping actually became like a term or a thing or a popular TV type show. Uh, they wanted to buy it, renovate it, and sell it in a hot property market. And, of course... It has its history and things go wrong. So <laughs> this doesn't even really try to pretend to be the Amityville house anymore. This is uh, a completely different entity with a completely different backstory and mythos and so forth. It just happens to take place in Amityville. The thing of this movie is this was totally forgettable. It really didn't have any characters of any merit, any storyline of any worth, and any development of any note. So this wound up being a bland, pap, vanilla paste bore of a movie, which is the worst thing that a movie can be. And that's 1990's The Amityville Curse. Number six on the list is Amityville 1992. It's about time. Made in 1992. And I'll be honest, when I was looking at the list of all these movies and their titles, this is one of the ones that really gave me pause and made me think that I was going to be in for a hell of a ride. And I was actually kind of pleasantly surprised by this one. I'm not going to say it was the best one of the lot so far, but it had a unique style and a unique aesthetic that was deeply unsettling in a really good way. So this movie starts out with the father coming home to his family after being on a business trip. It has kind of a poltergeist-esque feel to it where he's surveying Site 2 of tract housing in which he lives in Site 1. And uh, he's bringing with him an artifact, a clock, that he recovered from one of the buildings that was torn down in Site 2. Guess which one? So at last count, we've so far had a haunted floor lamp. Now we also add into it a haunted clock. And of course, as soon as it's put on the mantle, things start going wrong for the family. The father gets bit by a dog on his leg and starts suffering. 
pretty intensely, uh, and other things happen in the way of quantum weirdness and so on. Now, I'll be the first to say that overall this storyline really doesn't hold up, and the premise is pretty laughable at best. But what I'll also say is that this movie actually has some remarkably good moments in it, even if the entirety of the film doesn't really stand up that well, which it doesn't. But the moments that it portrays here uh, really kind of almost vindicate it. Certainly, I think that it deserves some level of redemption from having some great effects, some great moments in here, just effective little tools and tricks. There's one scene in which characters are trying to get out. There's people on the other side of the door with glass panels. They're pounding on it, trying to get out, and the other people are seeing straight through to the house with nobody on the other side of the glass. And the pounding of the door, you can see it visibly shake on one side and nothing on the other. It's a simple device, but it worked really well. And that's one of the th key things about this movie is between the effects and the simple devices that work well, this had good moments in it. I kind of wish it turned into a good movie, but we can't have everything now, can we? Let's be honest. When a TV show or a movie tacks on something about the next generation, it's a little bit of a sink or swim moment. Such was the case with the 1993 movie Amityville, A New Generation. And if you're wondering whether this was sink or swim, I would have to say that this was swim all the way. Surprisingly so. I actually found this to be a very enjoyable and worthwhile movie. A young man and photographer wants to break into the scene and have his art shown and be famous and have his work recognized more than anything else. So he works with other artists in his hippie commune living block area and wants to put on a bit of a gala. The problem is he also encounters a homeless man who gifts upon him a mirror. This mirror came from an unknown location, yes where, and things start happening that are just kind of off and wrong as soon as this mirror starts entering into their lives. So haunted floor lamp, haunted clock, Haunted Mirror. We're really getting into it now. But the fact is, this really had some fantastic characters to it. The storyline really surprised and intrigued me because although it's silly on its face, it had a lot of depth to it beyond that face value. I was enthralled, I was intrigued, and as things were happening to these characters, I actually kind of found myself giving a shit about it which for the seventh movie in a franchise is pretty remarkable in and of itself. Aesthetically, this is one of the most early 90s movies I've ever seen in my entire life, but it works well, it fits the narrative. The last thing that I really kind of want to point out with this movie before moving on to the next one is, for a haunted mirror concept, it actually really wasn't that big of a stretch. It could have been silly, it could have been a one-line kind of thing, we picked this up, it's, you know, flea market kind of thing, but it actually managed to really embed itself in with the character storyline and the plot. It felt well-developed, rich, and just generally thought out, which is kind of the last thing that I really expected. So this one really blindsided me and took me by surprise. For a franchise that I thought would be absolutely painful, so far, this actually hasn't been that bad. Movie number eight, 1996's The Amityville Dollhouse. So a man marries a woman, they get their collective kids together, they move into this new house that he built on the property site of a house that caught on fire, guess which one, and things start going wrong. I really don't want to talk about, I don't want to talk about anything else of this movie aside from the fact that there is a majorly irritating character in here. One of the most annoying preteen characters I've ever seen. I just wanted to throttle him from start to finish. We're finally here. Mom, are you sure it's up to code? Hey, Jim. It's by the book. What about earthquake proofing, Mr. Martin? You can call him Bill. I even made sure that your bedroom has the best view of the backyard. I'm gonna show you? Not in a million years, Bill. But I also don't want to talk about that. What I want to talk about more than anything else is Clayton Murray. For a movie that was straight to video, pretty much just kind of lukewarm to medium average, just eh, kind of, it was a throwaway. Uh, and the scores will reflect that. The standout for me was Clayton Murray, who played this irritating young boy's uh, dead father. 
And as the haunting elements were going on, this father was a little bit more present only to this kid because he felt like a bit of an outsider. He wanted his dad back and he didn't want to embrace his stepdad or his new family. Uh, so as the movie progresses, this character comes in more and more of a dilapidated state, uh, you know, just flesh rotting off the bones, you know, started out looking fairly normal by the end of the movie, very much not. But this character is portrayed by actor Clayton Murray, who, if you look him up on his IMDb credits, you'll see a sparse, not a whole lot. He's been in like one-off episodes of maybe a handful of shows like Star Trek Voyager, but he delivered in this one in a major way. It astounded me. How is Clayton Murray not bigger just because of Amityville Dollhouse? It's really easy for an actor to be dressed up in foam latex and just, you know, all sorts of makeup and goop and blood and so on and so forth and deliver a very stilted performance. Just kind of generally being in there and allowing the makeup to be the scary element as you just kind of earn your wage and clean up and go home. But Clayton Murray actually brought a level of sinister joy to this role that I was not expecting and I was thrilled with. They're coming for you, Bill. And they are going to eat your soul. <laughs> he was having a blast and it showed and it was dark and dark in just the most wonderful wink and a smile kind of way. It's this level of joyful malevolence that you don't often see put to screen anymore. And I loved it. Clayton Murray, wherever you are, thank you. I tip my hat to you and damn it, you really should have taken off way more than you did. The next movie we have on the docket comes nine years after the last one, and it's the 2005 remake of The Amityville Horror. So this is obviously the remake that stars Ryan Reynolds, and it opened to some decidedly mixed to negative reviews. I had never actually watched it personally until just now. So I'm going to, in the interest of time of an already lengthy video, abscond from giving an overview of what this movie's about, and instead just diving right into my thoughts on it. First of all, this has some major differences to the original, uh, even to the original Lutz storyline there, including the aesthetics of the house. It takes a lot of liberties, especially with the backstory of even before the DeFeo family moved in. And generally, I found this movie to be a bit soulless. I really couldn't figure out what it was trying to accomplish, what it was trying to say. And I think that it really didn't have a voice. And that was my major problem with it. If you're going to have a remake, if you're going to have something that deviates so far from the original source material, at least have something to say. And here's where I really think that that was a missed opportunity with this movie. You see, there's a lot of a, a particular theme floating around in a lot of these movies and that is being a step-parent. And one of the great things that horror does is it takes human elements of fear and difficulty and strife, and it can put it in the foreground with the supernatural overtone to expand on it and really dissect it through a larger magnifying glass than the subtlety of reality allows. And I know firsthand how difficult it is to be thrust into the role of a step-parent. One day you're a bachelor, the next day, you're responsible for these children. And it's a difficult transition for them too. The entire family goes into upheaval and that is something that could easily have been the voice of this movie. Instead of Ryan Reynolds going from step parent of the year to a murderous asshole with the flip of a switch, if we had seen more of a good hearted patient nature still struggling with this new role, with these new responsibilities, with trying to manage a job, newly married, have this house that's a financial burden and having to take care of these kids, all of whom are still struggling with the role that you're in, I think it would have been a little bit more human. It would have been a little bit more of a connection. It definitely would have brought the film to life a lot more than it did. One thing I found is that as a step parent and even a parent, there's often those moments in which you really have to check yourself where they're just a loudness and obnoxiousness and a million questions coming through and you're like, okay, give me a minute, one minute. <laughs> I think that that is a feeling that could definitely be expanded on 
in the realm of horror when we're dealing with a stepfather being slowly possessed. And also as far as what this movie was trying to say, not just the step-parent aspect, but I think it also could have been explored a lot more considering that we're dealing with somebody that is acting in a fashion that is abusive toward his family as he slowly gets possessed. It could have also had a very strong voice in the nature of breaking the cycle of abuse if we actually got to the heart of George Lutz in this film, since it's already taking creative liberties with the story, maybe provide him with a little bit of a backstory as far as his childhood and how his father treated him and how he's determined to try and break that cycle. Then all of a sudden, now we have a situation where we have a flawed but relatable human person that is undergoing these changes and actively fighting. So we not only have stakes for the family, we have stakes for this man that we have this connection with, this human connection. And that is the thing that is most missing from this movie is any sort of connection. It had a high production value. It had a lot of beautiful aesthetics to it. This was a pretty gorgeous movie, but ultimately for me, I just kind of found it to be a beautiful, loud disappointment. All right, bring on the found footage. So yeah, the first found footage movie of the series, we have the 2011 film, The Amityville Haunting, not horror, haunting. So would you believe it? A family finds a house on the cheap and it's just right in their budget. It's about the only thing in their budget and they go ahead and move in and things start going wrong. <laughs> wow. All right. So the thing of it is for this one is it's not the worst movie I've ever seen. It's not the worst horror movie I've ever seen. But I've been honestly struggling to try and think of a found footage movie that I liked worse than this one. And I'm not saying it isn't out there. I'm just saying I haven't remembered it yet. To my recollection, this is the worst found footage horror film I have seen. It is a terrible movie. And I think that ultimately comes down to the characters. All of them are pieces of shit. Especially the one always holding the camera, the little fucker Tyler. Just constantly up in everybody's business, annoying the hell out of them. The father is a pip. He's just kind of, you know, he's that father that raises his kids to always be sir, yes, sir, and double time and that kind of thing. And it just really, really uh, makes me hate him. SOP. Standard operating position. Come on, you can do better than that, son. Uh, standard operating procedure? Outstanding. It's honestly difficult to get involved and invested in a horror movie and be afraid of the stakes of the family's lives when you're actively wanting them to meet their demise. And that is where this movie really falls down. It is either boring or it's infuriating and you just want it to be over the end. So in 2012, a documentary was made about the Amityville haunting, the Lutz family, and specifically the eldest son, Daniel Lutz. Catching up with him as an adult now, finding out what his life was like living under the shadow of the Amityville haunting, having all the movies come out and so on and so forth, and what this did to his psyche. And this was the documentary, My Amityville Horror. And so far, I have to admit, this is my favorite film that I have watched so far of this entire series. If you are in any way interested in the Amityville Haunting, I really strongly recommend this documentary. I found it to be personally objective, comprehensive, thoughtful, respectful, and heartbreaking. We get to know Daniel Lutz, who he is now versus who he was then, and his relationship with his stepfather George, and the situations of what happened during the haunting in his words, in his mind, in his memory, as well as the cavalcade of other people that were involved in this in one way or another. We had journalists, we had TV news anchors that were provided exclusive access to this by George Lutz. We have people just brought out of the woodwork that had firsthand accounts of a lot of situations. And the one that surprised me the most is they actually brought Daniel Lutz back into the home of one of the original investigators, Lorraine Warren. Dad. How are you? It's so nice to see you. Oh, How are you? Good. I'm well. Thank you. How are you? Man, I'm doing well. Oh, it's good to see you. Thank you. Very, very good to see you. I haven't seen you, but I'm sorry about it. Thank you, honey. So am I. So am I, honey. Now, although this movie treats its source material very respectfully, it also doesn't take it at face value. We see them interview folks that are experts in their field of memory and the nature of human memory, especially under 
certain influences as adolescents. People can exaggerate what they've experienced. Uh, they can exaggerate a little or exaggerate a lot. They can add details to an experience. We remember bits and pieces of experience, but we'll fill in the gaps in our memory. Things we learned from other places, inferences we drew, which we decide probably happen, and we use those to fill in the gaps in memory. It's not afraid to ask the questions, is Daniel Lutz lying? Is he telling the truth perfectly? Or is he telling the truth as he remembers it through decades of influence, media, and the cobbled together stew that would be his memories of those events? Now, as you can see, the scoring is a little bit different, at least in terms of what I typically will score on a documentary versus a fictional piece of work. But the numbers remain the same, and I loved this movie. I heartily recommend it for anybody that is a fan of horror movies or these horror stories that you want to get to a little bit more meat of the history and how people are doing and the interviews are just fantastic overall well edited well put together very thoughtful i loved this movie i need to talk to you about a man he's not an ordinary man he's not a sane man but it is a man named Andrew Jones. On his IMDb page, he has listed 27 credits to his name in directing alone. Since 2013, he has directed 25 movies. That averages out to over three a year. He knocks them out fast and he knocks them out cheap. Story, acting, camera work, lighting, audio, effects, and editing be damned. Such is the case with the 2013 movie, The Amityville Asylum, the 12th in this series. We have crossed over the halfway mark and we have done so with flying colors because this is the first truly painful movie. A young woman takes a job as a custodian in an asylum in Amityville, only to find out once she gets started working the night shift that there's more than just evil there, there's dark secrets. You would uh, mainly be working nights at a time when patients are on lockdown, but um, many of our patients here have psychological disturbances. I mean, Amityville Dollhouse was, eh, it was straight to video. What are you going to do? It was average. It wasn't bad. It just wasn't, well, very good. <laughs> you know, the Amityville Curse was probably the only one that I would think would be uh, just less than noteworthy on any level just because of how boring it was, but... It wasn't Andrew Jones bad. That's a whole nother level of bad. Now here we come to the most difficult part of the job. Cleaning crap isn't the difficult part. What's behind it? This leads down to Ward X. Sounds ominous. You could say that. I maintain that you haven't seen bad horror until you see an Andrew Jones horror movie. And I guess on that basis, <laughs> I somehow recommend this one? Okay. Up next, we have the 2013 movie, The Amityville Playhouse, also known as The Amityville Theater. In this movie, we have a character whose parents had recently just died, and she inherited a lot of property, including a theater in the town of Amityville, where her friends decide that they should all go for a weekend visit, camp out, so on and so forth in this new theater, well, old theater, but new to her, to find out what the property is actually like, whether she should keep it, whether she should sell it, and so on and so forth. Seems like a bit of a responsibility for what I can only assume is a senior in high school, but here we are. This movie was not fun. Well, I'm not leaving. I don't know about that. Oh. What's your name anyways? Mary Jane, what the fuck's it got to do with you? Just making conversation. Sheesh. My name's Jeff, Jevin. It wasn't fun to sit through. It wasn't fun to watch. There was nothing really redeeming about it. The only thing it really had to its name was some really terrible acting, poorly written dialogue, delivered even worse. Who cares? The bitch is probably shit-faced. Do you want to buy me lunch, babe? Yeah, I guess. Hey, I wonder if they do a chicken fried steak here. We never actually find this out, and I'll never forgive this movie for that and characters that knew how to do nothing but insult each other in third grade parlance. One thing that really didn't help this film is the fact that they entered in through the service entrance once they got to the theater, 
And then the entire first third of the movie took place on stairwells, hallways, and behind the scenes, showing nothing interesting in the way of stage, seating, box office, anything that you might associate with the theater. It was instead just industrial pipes and dressing rooms. But that's not the whipped cream on top, no sir. In fact, what was, was a subplot involving a town-wide conspiracy as somebody was investigating things on the outside while they're trapped on the inside, so on and so forth. This was miserable through and through. This was amateur hour at every single stage. I honestly feel a little bad criticizing it as much as I have been just because I really get the feeling that all of the actors did their performances on a voluntary basis. Uh, but even so, just reviewing the film on its own merits, trying to be as impartial as possible, they really were terrible performances. Some movies do a whole lot with just a little, and some movies just don't have a whole lot. So I just finished watching the 2015 movie Amityville Death House. In this film, we have a group of teenagers that are traveling up from down south, and they are they had helped with the hurricane relief efforts. And along the way, they want to stop and visit one of their grandmothers in Amityville to just check in on her and have a place to rest their heads for the night before continuing on with their journey. They find the state of the house into a, from what they say, a dilapidated condition. Honestly, to me, it kind of just looked like every single house in rural New York. But regardless, they managed to slip in just about every single horror movie into this one by ripping off both Amityville and Evil Dead. Now, for me, one of the most intriguing things about this movie is the mysteries and the questions that it raises. Most notably, how in the fuck did they get Eric Roberts to star in this one? No stuff of lights, cops, nothing. Go on, you join your wife. You love her? Yes. Granted, he's sitting behind a desk wearing a cage mask the entire time, but it's undoubtedly him. So this was another one that really wasn't all that great. It just it wasn't very good at all. Uh, really comes down to a lot of the writing. I would break it apart, except that that would be pretty much covering the entirety of the film. It was just bad. Put her in the water. It'll cool her off. Maybe we better just call someone. Put her in the water. Now granted, one of them was possessed, the one pointing and saying, put her in the barrel. That was possession, but the other one wasn't. What made him think that, okay, I was going to call an ambulance, but fuck it. He says, throw her in the barrel. She has 115,000 degree temperature. Throw her in the barrel. Let's go. Why not? This is the kind of character rationale I'm talking about when it comes to the writing and the dialogue delivery didn't do it any favors. So this had some of the worst effects, some of the worst makeup. Look at this old lady makeup right here. Jesus Christ. It was bad. Well, hey there, and welcome to Rotted Reviews. I just watched the 2015 movie Amityville, the final chapter. Now you might be asking yourself, what does this movie have to do with Amityville? And I can answer that very simply. Fuck all! This was originally a movie called Sickle. This is a grand example of making a cheap movie and slapping on a famous name to it. So in this movie, we have a young man who is accused of killing his babysitter in horrible fashion and gets put away in a mental asylum only to be released 15 years later in the now present at least as far as the narrative goes. Simultaneously, somebody comes to town and she starts a ghost hunters group and he gets wrangled up into the group and there's just this whole fucking thing. Then we get this old weird dude that has this very odd cadence to his speech. I do have some overgrown grass that the neighbors are complaining about. I need that remedied. And I've noticed that some of the cement around the foundation of my home is beginning to crumble. I need that patched up. Blank! If it couldn't be kind of garnered from the way I've been talking about it, this really wasn't that great of a movie. It was bad. It was tough to sit through. I was so happy when the end credits rolled until I remembered that this was number 15. Seven more to go. So, question for you. 
Any idea what it takes to turn a mediocre movie great? Well, you could increase the quality of it, or you could just watch a shitload of bad ones right before it. Turns out, if that's the case, a mediocre movie can also be pretty rejuvenating for the soul. Such was the case with the 2016 movie The Amityville Terror. Now, I want to be completely crystal clear on this one. I by no means consider this to be a good movie. But it was a lot better than the previous few entries, and it came just in the nick of time. I really needed something beyond terrible, even if it was on the low end of mediocre. <laughs> Should I even try describing this one? How about it? A family moves into a house. It's an unbelievable price. He's basically uh, father, mother, and daughter moving in with the father's sister. Just, it's a family get together and she, this aunt has this unbelievable deal with rent on this house. And of course there's more than meets the eye. There's devilish stuff happening and evil and all sorts of possession shit. Remember, if it's too good to be true, it's Amityville. The absolute honest truth is there really wasn't a whole lot remarkable about this movie, but aside from that, it was performed adequately. The storyline, the dialogue, the characters, the editing, all of it came through as a fairly solid grounded movie. There was absolutely nothing about it that I would rave about but nothing about it that I would harp on either. It really just kind of served as a very middle of the road, average film. And honestly, if I had seen this towards the beginning of things, if this was a 1982 movie and chronologically it was one of the first ones I tackled, I might be judging it a little bit more harshly than I am now. But all things being what they are in this challenge, this was exactly what I needed. Believe it or not, 17 movies into a franchise, we get ourselves a good one. 2017's Amityville The Awakening. This was actually a pretty unique concept. I like it when movies go meta like this, and this certainly does that. This takes place several decades after the Lutz family hightailed it out of the Amityville house. That's right, we're actually back in the house proper. We're finally grounded in the source elements. So a uh, family moves into the house they it's a it's, one of, it's an unbelievable deal oh boy uh but yes they move into the house there's actually some pretty good rationale for that this time around see one of the family members is a critically injured young man who is uh basically on a bunch of medical machines to just keep him alive and according to the mother this is a house that is very near to one of the premier research facilities that could possibly help him okay you know what? That's good. That sold me. But even further than that, the history of the Lutz family and the history of the DeFeo family is very well known in this universe, as is the actual Amityville movies, James Brolin, Margot Kidder, so on and so forth. It exists within this universe. It's just that this protagonist, this young girl, had never heard of it before until classmates of hers brought it up as soon as she revealed where she was now living in this new town. So that added some interesting aspects. I, like I said, I like it when movies go meta like that. I love New Nightmare, things like that. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, that was something that I could actually rally behind. I could get behind, you know, I identified with those classmates. They're like, we have the opportunity to watch this movie in the house. Let's do it. Yes, I would be that guy. But I thought one of the really interesting things about this is that the core of the film it has to do with, uh, well, okay, there's haunting elements to it. There's creepy shit happening. But the core is the possession of the weakest member of the family. And typically, when you get things like, a, you know, somebody in an emotional turmoil or a young child, things like that. But in this case, we actually have somebody with a physical disability trapped in their own body. And the situations that arise from them seemingly getting better tend to fracture this family in terms of, what people hope for versus what people believe should and shouldn't be. Now, this was a Blumhouse production, and this had high production quality written all over it. This was remarkably well done. It was beautiful. Honestly, I have to say that this is kind of the movie that I wish that the 2005 remake could have been if it actually managed to have a little bit more heart and soul to it. I think we would have wound up with a movie on par with Amityville The Awakening. Oh, we're getting there. Number 18 out of 22. The 2017 movie, Hamityville, 
exorcism. All right, roll call. So far, we have had a haunted floor lamp, a haunted clock, a haunted mirror, and a haunted dollhouse. It's time for some haunted scrap lumber. No, I'm not fucking around. That is the core basis of this movie. This wood, this lumber, where did it come from? That's just leftover uh, scraps from the floor renovations. A contractor that was involved with the renovation before it was cleansed of the Amityville house used some scrap lumber to do a project in this other house, which then caused it to possess one of the occupants, a teenage girl. So she's fighting this possession while also fighting her alcoholic dad. A priest manages to find all this out after that contractor had murdered a whole bunch of people and so on, uh, and then confessed to the priest. So then he tracks him down, so on and so forth, continues on from there. Now, one of the first things that I noticed about this movie was that there were some very, uh, well, there was a lot of actor overlap with Amityville Death House. And so I looked it up and I found out something rather interesting. See, both of these movies were directed by Mark Polonia. And if you thought Andrew Jones was something, Mark Polonia, <laughs> he's something else. Same kind of deal, puts out movies fast, puts them out movies cheap, and generally has just schlock to his name. Things like Land Shark and Bigfoot versus whatever the fuck. <laughs> his IMDb credits, I told you that since 2013, Andrew Jones has uh, something like 25 directorial credits to his name. This guy, Mark Polonia, has 26. He beats him by one. It's the same kind of thing, though. There were years in which he had five movies that he directed. So yes, we had some actor overlap. Clearly this is a bit of a crew and it was just as vapid, actually even more so. The thing about Amityville Ghost House is some of that was rather entertaining in places every once in a while. For the most part, it was boring schlock. This one was boring schlock all the way through. It treated itself fairly seriously, which really belied the poor camera work, desperately poor acting and terrible effects you did this to me you worthless drunk no good husband you caused my death for a movie with such a ridiculous premise i honestly wish that it did have a little bit more of a wink and a smile to it but it really was absent in the face of trying to put out a low budget dramatic horror film from what i can tell that had no smiles to it and it seems like kind of i don't know uh just a lazy method of filmmaking really and that's a little bit I don't know about inexcusable I don't want to get too high up on my horse here but it didn't make for a very good watch in fact it made for a very terrible one it was a tough movie to sit through I really wouldn't recommend Amityville Exorcism the next film on our list is the 2018 movie The Amityville Murders so I think the best way to really describe this movie is it's basically Amityville 2 The Possession remake. Uh, actually, if you think way back when I mentioned that Amityville 2 had that weird transition where the storyline wrapped up at the two-thirds mark and the rest of it was kind of stretched into this subplot thing that I didn't care about. And I mentioned I wish that they hadn't done that and instead taken that two-thirds at the beginning and stretched it out to a feature length. Well... That's pretty much what happened here. And all I'll say is be careful what you wish for. This basically takes the concept of the DeFeo family and actually they use the name this time and shows a, a fictional approximation of what happened in the preceding events before the climax of Ronald DeFeo killing his family. And I'll be honest, I actually don't know the intricate details of the reality of this family well enough to really comment on the accuracy of this film so all i'll really say is without knowing how accurate the original story is this takes the amityville 2 premise and brings a lot more detail to the table the abusive father the uh, drug use and so on and so forth the, uh, it, it just really amplifies it this turns it into a fairly high budget production with a fairly 
unique aesthetic style that is actually quite well polished. For an hour and 37 minute long movie, I found that this was an incredibly long hour and a half. It just didn't really capture me. All of the characters were pretty shitty, not badly written, not badly performed. They just were dreary. They were assholes living in a dreary house in a dreary environment. And that's a tough thing to really latch onto. I had no connection to anybody in this movie. So I was only watching people do shit on screen for an hour and a half, as opposed to being in there with them, invested in any kind of storyline or outcome with these characters. So although I think that there were some very interesting parts of this movie, most notably the fact that Burt Young and Diane Franklin came back to the series, they were both uh, parents in Pro Amityville 2, The Possession, they came back in different roles this time. How are you gonna get the... <laughs> You're not gonna walk. <laughs> Damn, buddy. Hey, buddy. I know, it, it's all too much. Family is everything, you know that. I own the dealership, don't worry about it. Uh, I thought that that was an interesting element to it to kind of bridge the past with the present and the storyline that is set in the past. But I can't say that it made for a good watch. I can't really recommend this one. I don't think it was bad, but I certainly wouldn't want to sit through it again. How about that? Okay. It's time to discuss the 2019 movie Amityville Mount Misery Road. I want to be perfectly clear on this. All the words that I've spoken about any of the movies before, I hold true to them. Um, I maybe sometimes put on a little bit of a panache style and humor and so on and so forth. But what the, I mean, the content, the meat of what I say, I mean, I try to deliver nothing but brutal honesty in a lot of these reviews, sometimes perhaps too much. So maybe I'm a little bit too harsh, especially on the more low budget stuff. But I want to make sure that my tone is absolutely clear on this one. So I'm not going to be embellishing, shouting a whole lot, things that people might expect from me watching a bad movie, because this is something different. This is something unique and special just because this movie broke barriers for me that I never thought a film would. When I first started this, I didn't have any real clue where this whole Amityville challenge would take me. And I really didn't expect it to take me here. At this point, in two plus years of doing this YouTube thing, I have reviewed close to possibly a little over, I don't know, I haven't counted, 400 horror movie reviews. I have looked at some of the bottom of the cinematic barrel and I have seen the abyss look back at me. So with that understanding of my history and my backlog and catalog of reviews, I issue the following statement. The 2019 movie, Amityville, Mount Misery Road, is the worst movie I have ever seen. This title was held by the Alcoretta film, The Dread Rattlin, for, oh, it wasn't after, after too long after I first started my channel that I came across that dreck, and I maintain, dreck it is. But this one was worse. And when I started to really realize that, I soul searched. I did everything I could to try and find some redemption in this movie, and I came up completely dry. This was a movie that was written and directed by the husband and wife team of Chuck and Carolina Morangiello. And I maintain that it is less of a movie and more of a vanity piece. And that is one of the biggest aspects that I just couldn't get around with this movie. They filmed themselves in their fancy car. They filmed themselves in their fancy house. They filmed themselves dancing around each other for absolutely no reason on a proposed trip up to New York from Florida to visit Mount Misery Road. So what does this have to do with Amityville? Nothing at all. I mean, Mount Misery Road is a known road. It has haunting storylines, Mothman, and so on and so forth. <sighs> Clearly, and this is not the first time that this has happened, they just attached the name to this project that they wanted to bring a little gravitas to it. Wait, why don't you come over here? I have 
so many articles online that I found and maybe you can take a look at that. Haunted Road Trip, one of Long Island creepiest places. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. And here, ghosts. Crazy Mary, who's that? They get to Mount Misery Road, they start looking at things and you hear the word babe about a million and a half times. One of them drops off the radar, the other one makes the movie solo from there, and that's it. Sorry, I spoiled it for you. That's it. That's really all there is. Show off the shiny car, show off the house, drive up, go into the woods, one of them goes, one of them stays, and credits. This was filmed on a phone and it feels like it. Everything about the production quality is really terrible. They can't seem to get the zoom right. They can't seem to get the autofocus right. Everything is in and out. The editing is haphazard at best. It is a fractured, terrible, hammy mess of a vanity project. Moreover, this has IMDb rating padding out the ass. This has 3.6 stars on IMDb on a viewer average. And in my opinion, that is only because of the padding that they have. Otherwise, I almost guarantee this would be one star, bottom 250 of the site. But wait, that's not the only thing that it broke for me. Something else that I've been asked countless times now by folks that know my channel, they would often ask me if there would ever be a movie that got no points. And I honestly couldn't think of any situation in which that would be possible. Even the Dread Rattlin, I gave some participation points for the acting since people technically showed up and read some lines, even if I didn't think the plot, intent, or technical were worth a damn. But this one, I fought with myself. I, I really did. There was no plot. There was no real storyline to think, speak of. There was a general outline in which they basically went out and just were themselves. Whatever the intent was, I wasn't buying it. Fail on that easily. The technical was atrocious, abhorrent, terrible, ugh. Zero points. I really don't have any problems with that. So that leaves the acting, the one holdout that the Dread Rattlin did manage to wind up squeaking out a few points. And I have to think about this and it's like, What acting? I, for, the, for the life of me, I can't figure out what act. These are people that are just going out and for a vanity project, just being themselves. If the characters that they were portraying truly were fabrications and that these are simply humble folks that are well-meaning and don't really have a vain bone in their body, then they deserve an Oscar for this shit. But I'm not buying it. I don't feel that way. This was the worst movie I've ever seen. I award it zero points <laughs> and never, I seriously never thought I would do that. I just, I, I, I just can't reconcile it any other way. Zero points for Amityville, <laughs> Mount Misery Road. Guess what? Hello again, Mark Polonia. It is the third film from him to have the Amityville name attached, thus making it eligible for this challenge Fuck you, Mark. Okay, okay, sorry. So in this one, the demonic presence of the Amityville house starts bouncing around from person to person. Jason goes to hell style until it finally lands in a housewife who then murders her kids and gets sent to a prison until she is transferred out of the prison and illegally sent to an island where they do genetic research on prisoners. All right, so you've heard me talk about Amityville Death House. You've heard me talk about Amityville Exorcism. And honestly, all the bad shit with both of those is present in this one. I'm not going to rehash all that. But what I will say is that this one actually was partially kind of fun. <laughs> it's in the same way as the sci-fi originals. And we finally have a little bit of a smile and nod and a wink at the camera kind of thing. So, I mean, that's something that I've honestly been waiting for. If we're going to have shitty effects and shitty quality and shitty acting and shitty camera work and shitty lighting and shitty dialogue, we may as well have just a little bit of fun with it, right? And Amityville Island seems to believe that, at least in parts. Honestly, 95% of this movie is pretty dull, boring. I check out, but that last 5% was infinitely better than especially Amityville Exorcism 
because it does actually finally start to try and have a little fun with things. The, the demonic presence hops out of her body and into a bear so that it can slaughter a guard. It's just, it was a singular moment in a river of shitty moments, but that singular moment was worthwhile and worth noting, and it does affect the score. So while those previous two had zero points on the intent, I actually gave this one a five. In fact, I went ahead and gave it a five all the way down the line. This gets a total of 20 points. <sighs> Bad movie, but at least somewhat fun. Number 22. I made it. I've watched them all. I'm done. And I'm here to report on this last one. Was it able to end with a flourish on a high note? Not in the slightest. 2020's The Amityville Toy Box. This one was actually a little bit confusing because it does have the title of Amityville Toy Box, but if you look at them up on an IMDb, the same filmmakers have done a few of them. And this one seems to have the plot of a different one and this the plot that's described on IMDb. It seems like it's a mess, but honestly, having watched the movie, I'm not fucking surprised. A family reunion happens on the birthday of the paterfamilias of the household. Everybody drives out there and meets back up and it's a little bit of a kind of just getting to know each other again, so on. All the tension and weirdness and so on of a family reunion mixed with this guy's birthday. And of course, one of the presents that he gets is a symbol monkey <laughs> coming from, well, guess where? So last roll call. We've had the haunted floor lamp, the haunted Clock, the haunted mirror, the haunted dollhouse, the haunted scrap lumber, and now the haunted toy monkey. So I know it's the last movie and I kind of feel like I should just give it a little bit more of a description, a little bit more of a send off, but I'll be honest, it really doesn't deserve it. All of the problems of a lot of these films are front and center present in this one. All of the characters are just terrible people. I don't really feel connected to any of them. It's poor dialogue. Whatever poor dialogue there was, was really not done a great service by having some really poor delivery. Just bad situations overall. Everything kind of came down to the writing and the acting and both were so piss poor that it made for just the worst watch. Well, almost the worst watch. I've certainly apparently seen worse, but even so, not a pleasant one. This challenge did not end gracefully and it did not let me off the hook in the final hours. And so now we reach the end of the road. This was fun, but I'm not gonna lie, it also wasn't easy. This was very painful in parts. Although I enjoy watching movies and I enjoy binging them and I enjoy bad ones as much as the next person, this was a lot. This was a lot and this was very masochistic. It took me eight days to watch all 22 movies. It's not my speed run record. I typically will watch, you know, 14 movies at a time and on 24 hour marathon kind of things. But 22 movies actually is a little bit more difficult than that. 24 hours is one thing and it's not easy staying awake that long, but 22 movies, that's something that has to be kind of broken up a bit and interjected with the normal course of life. And that was the real hard part for me. That's why it took eight days was I had work. I had responsibilities. I had schedules to adhere to. I had other reviews to make. I had other movies to watch beyond this to make those reviews. <laughs> so this had to be fit in between everything else and all told eight days. And now you know the nature of the challenge and the gauntlet has been thrown down. Do you think that you can watch all 22 of the same Amityville movies that I did in the order that I did in less than eight days, I'd like to see you try. And I'd sure like to hear from you if you do try. Other than that, I want to close this out by saying thank you so much for sticking with this and watching my longest video to date. This has been, well, it's been a ride. So thank you again. I look forward to seeing you in my next review. Remember next time you want to watch a horror movie, first make sure that it's good and rotted.